Gude and welcome to this video, where I will talk with Josh Meyer from Koki AI about XTTS. But before starting with the actual video, let me say two thank you. On the one side to you, my wonderful YouTube community, for providing me with XTTS related questions. And on the other side, obviously, to Josh for taking his time to talk with me on this XTTS topic. It's been a pleasure having you as my first ever interview partner or guest on this YouTube channel. And as it's the first time, please let me know in the comment box below what you think. Is this interview type format something you would like to see more often? And if so, who would you like to see as a next guest on this channel? And do not forget to give this video a thumb up and a subscribe on my channel. Thank you. And now, without further ado, let's put the spotlight on to Josh. <laughs> First of all, Josh, uh, let me say thank you for taking uh, some time to talk with me on your newest XTTS evolution or product or project. And um, before this video, I asked my wonderful YouTube community on questions in the comment box on XTTS. To be honest and transparent, I sent you, so Josh, the questions the community sent me yep. before. So you could talk with your crew and uh, team and uh, hopefully provide us uh, the best possible answers or information on XTTS. Yep. yep. So, and again, that's all for the intro. So thank you, Josh, for, for taking your time and uh, for joining me today. Yeah, um, I am excited to be, I'm honored to be the first guest here. Um, it's a, you know, I've been following your YouTube channel and this other kind of work you've been doing, the open wiki. I recently actually uh, was Googling for just Googling for an answer on speech technology. And the first best answer was your wiki. But uh, yeah, so I'm um, happy to, to talk about XTTS from all different fun angles. Uh, if anybody's watching that wants really deep into the weeds, technical information on the XTTS, I would encourage you to check out um, our Discord server and, and talk to some of our uh, core engineers who are working on it. Um, I've been involved with XTTS uh, since we've been working on it, but I'm not the one who's super deep in the weed, you know, training the models. I don't get to train models so much anymore, unfortunately. But that being said, uh, happy to, to jump in. Maybe you would like to introduce yourself for the people you do not know you yet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so my name is Josh Meyer. Uh, I've been working on speech technology for over a decade now, which sounds weird to say, uh, but I came out of academia. I did a PhD in speech recognition um, and focused at that time. And I've always had a, a, a deep love of uh, expanding speech technologies to new languages that are typically, um, how do you say, underrepresented, underserved. Um, so I spent a good chunk of time, something like six or seven years working on speech recognition and making um, these kind of deep neural net models work more efficiently when you have only a small amount of data. So I looked at fine tuning uh, and multitask learning. And towards the end of my research, uh, kind of academic research, I joined the Mozilla group working on speech technology. So at the time, there were kind of three projects going on in parallel. There was Project Common Voice, um, there was Project Deep Speech, and then there was TTS, uh, Text-to-Speech. And for, um, for a long time, the Project Deep Speech and Project Common Voice were the kind of the shining stars of Mozilla working on speech technology. Actually, historically, Project Common Voice came out of a need from Project Deep Speech. So they started working on Project Deep Speech. They realized they need more data. Uh, and that's where Project Common Voice kind of came to life. And so I joined the team. Um, basically, they were working on English. They were making very good speech technologies for English. And my kind of ax to grind was, how do we make this work for as many languages as possible? So that's what I spent most of my time working with them both on the data collection side and on the um, training uh, speech recognition model side. All the time in parallel, uh, our team wasn't big 
it wasn't huge to begin with. And there was always uh, one person working on TTS, that's Aaron. And um, Aaron <clears throat> kept working on TTS and kept making these breakthroughs and uh, ended up having these new algorithms, especially for zero-shot voice cloning, cross-lingual zero-shot voice cloning that ended up being, um, as, to the best of my knowledge, the first kind of publicly available uh, proof of concept we had, I think it was like two years ago, uh, and it went viral on Hacker News. If I go back and listen to the quality of that now versus what we have today, uh, it makes me cringe. <laughs> like, you know, every time we have new, it, 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 the state of the art is moving so fast that um, every breakthrough, you you listen to it and you think, how did I ever like this stuff in the past? You know, um, but in any case, uh, long story short, started in academia, joined Mozilla, working on open speech technologies, open source. Uh, the product was always MPL 2.0, and the data was released under the Creative Commons uh, zero. And basically, we were working as a team, um, and we decided that the projects we were working on, we could, uh, outside of Mozilla, get some get some resources, build a bigger team, and really push this further, uh, more than just kind of an R&D project inside Mozilla. So that's what we did. Um, about uh, two and a half or something uh, years ago, we left Mozilla as a team, the machine learning group, uh, Project Common Voice continued, um, but we left as a group to, to continue working on speech technologies. And in particular, we started making more and more breakthroughs with the ETS, with the, the, the generative voice, I guess people are calling it now, right? Um, and uh, we felt the strongest pull in that direction. So we've focused uh, our entire company to work on uh, TTS and not just TTS, but also voice cloning and, and cross-lingual voice cloning. And um, yeah, that's where we are today. I, we still have a, a very strong open source uh, project, the TTS project, which is released under the MPL uh, 2.0 and different models are released under their own licenses um but i think that's something that's really special about us and what we're doing is we have we're a for-profit company uh we have an api that's a paid access and we have a koki studio which is a kind of creator application so for people who don't code but they want to use these uh, core technologies in their workflow like let's say an animation team or a video game development team studio, um, if they want to use these technologies and have a nice interface, I kind of pitch it as a garage band for voiceover. Um, that's that's what we provide. And then we also have the open uh, source or open access. There's, there's some uh, nuance there. Um, but we open really openly release uh, lots of code and models. And um, I think that's something that's special about us and our project uh, is that we are we started as an open project and we've kept that at our core. So that's maybe a long intro, but uh, there, there it is. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and let's start with the probably most obvious question. So yep. what is XTTS? And what makes it so special in comparison to existing models? Yeah. Um, so the X doesn't officially stand for anything. <laughs> um, I uh, I like to think of it as extra good TTS. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's also kind of expressive TTS. Um, we, de we decided on the name before Twitter switched to X, so it's unrelated. Um, but XTTS is a... Mm, it's a voice synthesis model that is able to uh, do zero shot voice cloning and also synthesize speech from that voice clone in any language that we've uh, trained the model on. So right now there's 13 languages and uh, next release is going to have more languages and the next release after that is having more languages. We're always adding more languages. Um, but um, in a nutshell, XTTS is a kind of this new wave of 
speech synthesis models. It's uh, basically the best one that's been openly released. It doesn't fit the typical kind of definitions of open source. So um, we created a new license for it. Um, there's a, we can get into the details of that, um, but basically it is currently released under the Koki public model license, the CPML. And it's uh, basically non-commercial use. You can do whatever you want with it. Uh, commercial use, we are very, we encourage it, but uh, you should come talk to us and get a, get a license, a commercial license from us. Um, but the model is, is special for a few reasons. So it stands out in terms of quality. Um, there's always been a pretty wide gap between the best open source or open access TTS model and what you can get commercially from providers. And the release of XTTS is, is closing that gap. Um, XTTS is actually the model that we have in production. Well, we have a, a version of it in production. Um, it is unlike lots of currently available speech synthesis models out there that are open access or open source. It's built on um, GPT and it the level of expressivity is, is much higher than you get these kind of, uh, you know, in, in the past, probably one of the most common model architectures out there is VITS. Um, and in general, a lot of the neural uh, voice models out there, they have this kind of, um, how do you say, kind of boring audiobook like uh, narrator style that is just a, um, how do you say, it's almost optimized to be not as expressive because that's easier for the model to learn. It's a function of the data that was used to train, but it's also a function of the arch architecture itself, actually. Um, and so XTTS is, is able to clone voices with a much higher emotional range. Um, it's something that we released, I think, just over a month ago. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, so it, it stands out for quality. It also stands out for for efficiency in terms of uh, compute usage. Uh, it can run on a GPU with as little as four gigs of VRAM. And in terms of speed, it's, it is the, the first of this kind of new wave of, of speech models that is got native model level streaming. So the, the latency, the time to the first chunk of audio from like you give it text and you start getting audio back can be as low as like 130 milliseconds on a 3090 GPU. Uh, so it's very fast. So this is, this is special for, I mean, this is kind of, we're already at the point where you could have this running alongside a game engine on your computer and be talking to uh, talking to your video game in real time, right? And this is with realistic voice, and that uh, has really not been possible before. So those are when I when when you ask me kind of what's what's XTTS, those are kind of the the most important things that come to my mind. Why is it special? It's it's a voice synthesis model. It's a voice cloning model. Those have been around before, but they've never been this high quality. They've never been this uh, fast, and they've never been able to run on such uh, normal consumer grade GPUs. So this is like, in terms of making uh, consumer grade engaging AI voice applications possible, this is, this, this is now possible. You addressed uh, two important points that I have on my uh, question list. <laughs> so that's a, a, good, a good point. On the one side, the, the new uh, Koki model license. We'll talk a little bit later about that. And uh, as you said, uh, running on your local system. And that's probably the next question. Uh, can I use XTTS to clone my own voice fully offline? Or are there any dependencies, as you said, the Koki Studio or that API provided? So can I clone my voice locally, offline, or not? 100%, yes. Um, 
I, when we first made the release, that was the first thing that I did was I wanted to make sure it's working on my MacBook with my CPU. Uh, so, you know, you can download it, use it. And if you're using it for, you know, your own purposes for personal, non-commercial, you can go do this today. You just do pip install TTS um, and you, you get the XTTS model. You use a clip of your own voice and you can start synthesizing, you know, you can turn off the, turn off your Wi-Fi and it'll still work, which is pretty awesome. Um, yeah. So the short answer is yes. Please let me know in the comments if I should make a tutorial on XTTS voice cloning locally. And um, so, as you said, just uh, run pip install TTS and then the magic uh, happens. Uh, that's probably answering the next question too. So if I can clone my voice locally, fully uh, Wi-Fi disconnected uh, after running pip install, obviously, mm -hmm. and um, I can synthesize for privacy or not non-commercial, I can synthesize the audio too locally. Yep. I guess. Yeah. And I'll say uh, also that there's one model, the XTTS model, which speaks all the languages. So you could uh, use, you know, five seconds of your voice speaking German and then synthesize your voice speaking English, Chinese, Arabic, whatever. You don't need to download 13 different models. It's one model. <laughs> Oh, well, then that's one of the other questions indeed. But uh, first of all, as you said, five seconds or I've read three or six seconds, yep. uh, around five seconds of pure audio, which is really amazing. Yeah, this six is enough. Optimal. Six? Okay. Yeah. And um, did you encounter if I, or if people would provide just six seconds of audio mm -hmm. um, or uh, in comparison to, let's say, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, does this affect the quality of the cloned voice or does this not make any sense? No, uh, it makes sense. Um, and this is something that people try to do all the time. The model has uh, explicit architecture to use six seconds. Um, so if you upload two minutes, it's not going to get any better. Um, And this is, this is something that we're very actively working on because it depends on the voice, right? Like sometimes six seconds is perfect and it gives you uh, an amazing voice that sounds identical. Sometimes it doesn't. And the question is, okay, what do I do next, right? Like if I don't like, um, if I don't like my voice clone from six seconds of me speaking from this audio clip, Uploading more isn't going to help. What will help is if you try different audio clips. So this is when I'm ever um, cloning a voice or doing a demo, um, maybe I have like 10 different audio clips that are each six seconds each. And I try them all and see which one I like best. Um, and actually a fun, this is kind of a, I guess a, a feature, <laughs> not a bug. Um, You can take the same voice, and I'd be interested to hear you do this because you've got uh, for the the Thorsten voice data set, you've also got emotional data, right? Yeah, true. Yeah, so you could um, make a clone of each of your emotions, and they would technically be different voices, but it would actually be one voice with different emotions. Um, we've seen people doing this. This is what I recommend to people who are who want to have explicit emotions that they could call from like the API, uh, whether it's via our SaaS API or locally, um, you can, uh, there's, there's some emotions that we provide. They're, they're limited. There's like, it's not for XTTS. So I'll say that clearly, but um, we, with our API, you can have like a happy, sad, angry, surprised. But if you're making a custom voice, You can record the voice doing any style or emotion, and then you can have that in your bank of emotions, right? It's just, yeah, it's a, it's a small tip. <laughs> so maybe that's uh, that's worth uh, an effort. So just to play around with my Torsten voice emotional data sets uh, and give this a try. But uh, what I found interesting, because I had expected that more audio data would provide 
other or better results. Yeah. But as when I got you right, six seconds is perfect. And if you are not satisfied with the result, do not upload more seconds, but instead use phonetical other input audio. So maybe just play around with the input text, but stay with six seconds because the model is optimized for this type of length. Yeah, yeah 100%. Don't upload more audio, upload different audio. Yeah, yeah I'll give this a try. So uh, maybe I'll make a special video on how multiple inputs on XTTS will lead to other results because <laughs> I think this might be really interesting. Yeah. In my opinion. Um, then you set one aspect on um, foreign languages. Mm -hmm. So normally, if I put German input, I would guess that I can clone my German voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that there are right now 13 languages, more to come soon, mm -hmm. um, supported. So XTTS provides the feature, I input six seconds of audio, and then let's say I synthesize French or uh, English in my cloned voice. Mm -hmm. That's possible. 100%. Yep. You know that I will give this a try and yeah. will uh, call you back if yeah. this is not working. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's that's it. You, you upload six seconds of any language and it actually doesn't have to be a language that we support. So for instance, we don't support um, Hindi currently. Okay. You could upload six seconds of yourself speaking Hindi or Bengali or whatever language, uh, and it still will synthesize perfectly in the other 13 languages. So the input can be anything uh, because we're, we're doing, it's a speaker embedding extraction. It doesn't rely on text, uh, so it's language independent. No, well, that's interesting. Uh, if you asked me this before, I would never get this. So <laughs> I really can, I can input to the model a language that is not supported. Mm -hmm. It's doing its uh, fa magical fairy dust uh, uh, machine learning magic. Mm -hmm. and uh, But it will just synthesize audio from 13 and more to come languages. But the input language does not matter at all. Correct. Yeah. One other question when it comes to foreign languages, mm -hmm. um, because this is mainly uh, or one of the questions that I hear a lot. Um, I guess this is true for most languages, but in German, I know this. We have lots of English words in our everyday talk. Mm -hmm. So talking on computers and cloud and party and whatever, we have yeah. lots of words that come from the English language. And um, normally the models have problems. When I synthesize my German model with maybe English words, this is not sound or not pronounced, mm -hmm. um, it, it should be. So how does or does XTTS handle an English phrase with foreign languages inside? Typically what happens, so this is called code switching, right? Like when you have mm -hmm. uh, a, a sentence that's mostly in one language, but you might switch into another language. Um, and there's also, it's interesting, there's, there's also kind of opinions on how this should be done. Should we keep the phonology of the first language or should we use the phonology of the second language. And um, if you're a fluent speaker in English and German, then you might use the English phonology, right? When you're switching. But if you don't speak English at all, then what would you do? But I think typically what happens is, uh, typically what happens is you get the native phonology of both languages. So if you're switching German and English, uh, you'll get English phonology coming out. Then the next uh, and important question, um, why should people subscribe to my Torsten Voice YouTube channel? Yeah. Uh, well, the simple answer is because you're the best YouTube channel for open voice technology. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I honestly think um, this is something that I've talked about uh a few years ago, like NLP, like the natural language processing has always had this kind of big hypey community with lots of people and lots of um, uh, ways to get information. But speech has not been like that. Voice technology has always been um, a smaller field. It's changing now. I think it's I think it's really changing now, especially with this new wave of technologies. And 
even for me, who's like, I've been in this space for over 10 years. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with like in the weeds, uh, but there's so much stuff happening all the time that it's, it's hard to make heads and tails of it, especially knowing what's IP noise from, you know, companies that are trying to sell you something versus what's interesting, you know, breakthroughs and interesting new technologies. And that's why I watch your videos. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also like, honestly, the, the, how hands-on, uh, like if somebody's trying to install and use a new tool, um, I still point people to your, your videos. Like when they're saying like, Oh, how do I, you know, how do I do Koki on, on windows? We have uh, one aspect when it comes to the RTF. So to the comparison of mm -hmm. CPU versus GPUs, as you mentioned, a uh, GPU 3090, uh, as a consumer hardware, uh, mm -hmm. provides really uh, way more than real time. Mm -hmm. So dot one dot two, uh, real time factor. Um, Are there any experiences for people that uh, just use a CPU because they have no CUDA enabled yeah. Uh, GPU? Yeah, so um, using a CPU makes sense if you are willing to, if it doesn't make sense currently for real time conversational applications, but if you want to generate like, I don't know, uh, let's say that you like listening to your news, but you don't like reading the news, you could, I could, you could very easily set up something on your laptop to, <clears throat> uh, you know, synthesize your favorite news channel, like the text, you could just like scrape the website, synthesize it overnight. And then when you wake up in the morning, you've got your audio file and then you just like, you get to listen to that. Right. Um, so anytime where you want to generate audio for consumption later, uh, it CPU makes a lot of sense. And CPU is not like crazy slow. I say overnight, that's kind of, that's overkill. Uh, the the real-time factor, is it 1.7? I feel that's not too bad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's too slow for a real-time conversation, but I mean, it, you know, uh, I think it's 1.7. So if you want to generate 10 seconds of, text it takes you 17 seconds to generate it like it's not it's not bad so the same model could be uh faster way faster than real time on a gpu or slower than real time on a cpu and there is a very real difference in the cost of those things too so mm. for instance we have customers that might be interested in using fast gpus because they have a real time game a video game they want to plug this into or they are generating news overnight and they're not generating on a laptop they're generating on servers uh but the cost of running you know uh let's say some slow gpus or fast cpus uh might be a really great time uh money saver for them right um so it's it's more than just like i guess we've talked a, a decent amount in this conversation about <clears throat> local um, but even if you're running in the cloud, there's, there's ways that this can interact, uh, and you can take advantage of, you know, the, the time cost trade-off. One question is when it comes to the license, because I guess people are sometimes confused because Koki's code repository is on the one side of this open, open source license. I guess it's, is it uh, Mozilla MPL? Uh, I'm not too sure, but so we have on the one side the code base, and people are sometimes confused. Yes, so um, so your question is uh, kind of clearing up a little confusion about the licensing situation with with Koki, right? Because Koki TTS is a repository on GitHub, um, and it contains code mostly in Python, um, and that code is for training and inference of models um, and all of that the the training and inference code uh, is released under the mozilla public license 2.0 uh, however there are individual models that you can uh, that are pre-trained that you can use inside koki tts and those have different licenses and some of those are licenses that we set 
and some of those are licenses that other people set, right? So, um, for instance, we support um, Meta's uh, Meta's uh, one thousand something um, speech synthesis models that are. Um, I think they're all under a non-commercial. I think it's the CC by non-commercial uh, 4.0. Uh, and then there's also different, you know, communities like you know, somebody and their friend decided to train a model in whatever Bulgarian, and they want to uh, share it with the community, so they release it under uh, Apache or MIT or something, and you know, make it very free. And so we have. Uh, a few different models under a few different licenses, but we've been talking about XTTS in particular. XTTS is released under a, a license that we created in collaboration with basically the world leader on open source licensing. Uh, she wrote the book on open source licensing, Heather Meeker. Um, so we we created a license for two reasons. One is we are a business uh, and we need to run the business sustainably. And right now releasing XTTS under a completely permissible license is something that um, we don't, we don't want to do because we need to monetize it somehow. Right. Um, and so like being very transparent there, we, you know, spend a lot of time and resources, uh, you know, GPUs are not cheap. Uh, and yeah, people need to get paid to use the GPUs to train the models. And this is all not cheap. And, and um, there's some other startups out there that their kind of paradigm right now is, uh, or let's say larger corporations where they can, they can afford to lose a few, a few million dollars uh, to release a model uh, openly, which is, which is really great for the community, but uh, we are, uh, not at the level of you know meta money that where we can throw away a few million dollars. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we created the CPML for two reasons. One was so that we can monetize the model because we do want it to be available for researchers and people who are using it for uh, non-commercial purposes. Like if you have a home assistant set up in your house that's controlling you know your refrigerator and your garage and you're like really into home assistant. Uh, love it we 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 get it we want you to run uh, xtts and, and do your thing um but if, if you're a corporation and you want to use the xtts xtts model we still want you to do that but we want to sell that to you right um so that's one reason why we created the the license another reason is um i i think and we we think uh largely uh is that Open source licensing for machine learning models is is a weird landscape, and the old licenses that have been typically approved by the open source initiative for uh, code for source code is uh, they, they don't apply to machine learning models for for a few reasons. So um, source code. It's very different from a machine learning model. Machine learning model is really closer to binary because it's been trained, it's compiled. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't like open a, a, a file of any machine learning model and, and interpret the weights and the parameters and make changes to them as if you were looking at the Linux kernel, right? Um, so I think a lot of, I think actually any of the open source initiative licenses that were written for source code don't make sense for machine learning models mm -hmm. and furthermore um the licenses from the uh, creative commons which those are kind of the two sets of licenses that people will typically use for machine learning models they'll either grab a license from the osi the open source uh, initiative or they'll grab one from creative commons and uh the creative common license uh, Creative Commons is licensed. Uh, they are made for some kind of content that has been artistically created. It's Creative Commons because they use them to license creative works, like a picture, a song, um, a photograph, or you know, like a painting, right? Um, 
And those licenses talk a lot about derivative works. And so I can take this and I can, uh, I take your photo and I can change the colors and then I can, you know, redistribute that and sell it. Or maybe I can't because the creative Commons has clear commercial, Mm -hmm. non-commercial. And so the problem with that is uh, those licenses were made for, human created things not for uh machine learning models that are they're almost kind of they're they're in a weird place because they're generated by code machine learning models are generated by code but then they can also generate content so we wanted to have a license that applied to both the model itself and the content that the model generates. And there's nothing really out there currently that does a good job at this. Um, So we also want it to be as kind of clear, interpretable as possible. The CPML is a very short license. I mean, you can read it. Uh, It's not like full of super legalese. It's it's, it's pretty clear what you can and can't do. it, it falls, you can basically do whatever you want as long as you're not using it commercially. So, um, yeah. So it, you try to, to close this gap between, as you said, uh, we have the source code yeah. side with uh, lots of uh, great licenses. We have the creative artists or artwork, music, photographs, and so on uh, a license. But this uh, new field, so machine learning models, um, there is this gap and you try to close this gap or find a good license or hope to find a good uh, license um, yeah. for this gap. Well, we, w- we wanted something that was going to work for us to create a sustainable business while also being able to share what we're doing with the research community. We all come from the research community, our team. We all come from the research community. We love working with the research community and also the open source community. I mean, we, we came from Mozilla and like this is, we built the project from open source. Um, so we wanted a license that was going to be as clear as possible and allowed everybody who's, you know, the, the DIY hackers, you know, who love Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and doing all that stuff. Uh, we wanted to make it so they could use this. And we also wanted the PhD students and the master's students and the universities to be able to use it. Um, it, it we wanted to, to get it out there. Uh, and so this is the clearest way that we could, we could do that. Um, but machine learning models are like compiled code that create content. So you want to be able to cover all of that. Um, and it's not just about um, restricting people from doing certain things. It, it, a, a license has to be very clear or else uh, companies, institutions, people won't use it if there's any, if there's any kind of unknowns. Mm. So that's, that's a, a reason that a, a license has to be very clear. Um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a hard thing. I, th- I think we we did our best to to make a good license, and I'm I'm personally very happy with the CPML. I think it's I, I love how clear and just straightforward it is. So I'll put a link to uh, the, the license um, in the description, so people can take a look to it and uh, get an idea of the license, and they now know the motivation and the idea of the new license, and. Uh, I'm really excited to see in the comments if the people have more questions or have now a better understanding on the on the idea on the vision of um, the requirement for this type of new license. So, and uh, when I take a look to our question catalog, I think that we uh, covered all the important topics. So, by now I can. Just to say, it's been a pleasure to have you yeah. as my first and special guest uh, on this uh, little place on YouTube on Open uh, Voice Technology. So, thank you, Josh, for taking your time, uh, for joining me today, and for providing, as I think, great answers to the questions. Thanks to you and to the team at Koki AI. And uh, if there's anything you would like to share, please. The, the, the next words are yours. Yeah, um, I'd say if you're watching this, uh, 
keep watching and follow uh, Thorsten because these videos are great. Uh, not just the videos, uh, you know, the content he posts on other platforms like Twitter, at least, or X, uh, I very much enjoy. Um, so uh, besides that, um, if you want to get involved with, uh, with Koki, there's a few ways. There's GitHub, uh, github.com slash Koki dash AI slash TTS. That's the, the main kind of project repository. Um, you can find also our models uh, and some demos on Hugging Face. Um, you just you know search for XTTS or search for Koki. Um, also, we have Discord. Uh, I guess we'll have a Discord link hopefully here. Um, the, the Discord is a really fun place. Like it's uh, it's something the community actually on Discord has has existed from way back in Mozilla times. Like originally it was IRC, and then we. Changed it to I think Element and then Gitter and now we're landed in Discord. Um, but it's a fun group of people. It's a lot of people who really uh, care about uh, sharing research, technology, what they're working on, and a lot of different language enthusiasts. So if there's a language that you want, you don't. It's not an XTTS yet. Uh, come chat with us uh, on Discord. There's people working on lots of different languages. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, Thorsten. Um, and uh, I, you know, if we want to do this again, I'm more than happy to. <laughs> thanks again, Josh. It's a pleasure for me. And I'll put all the links Josh mentioned right now in the description box. So thank you, Josh. I wish you a nice rest of the day. And again, thank you. And hopefully we'll stay in regular contact and see us soon. Yes, definitely. Thanks. <laughs> Bye, Josh. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it useful. Please give this video a thumb up if it is so. Do not forget to subscribe to my channel. And please let me know in the comment box about what you think on this interview type format and who you would like to see as a next guest, just in case you liked the video. And so that's all. I hope you liked it. I wish you all a nice rest of the day. And if you like, we might see us next time. Bye.